Council, if you will come to order, it is 7.02 p.m. We do have a quorum. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Lamont is not here, but we do expect him shortly. Oh, uh, he is here just now. And uh, we can start now. <laughs> <laughs> and in just a moment, uh, I'm going to ask uh, everyone to stand, and I will lead us in an invocation for this evening and then remain standing and you'll be led in pledges to the U.S. flag and the Texas flag uh, and follow along with Council Member Philip Schaffner. If you would please stand. Gracious God, our creator and sustainer, we are indeed grateful for the blessings of life that you give to all of us and especially the blessings that we receive by living in a wonderful country that is free to worship and to plan and to control our destiny. We ask for your blessings upon our deliberation tonight. May we be led by your wisdom and by your insight, and may we give the honor and the praise unto thee. In Jesus' name, amen. States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. You may be seated. <coughs> So I noticed some of you knew that pledge well. You must have been students and said it faster than we did. Well, I welcome everyone this evening. We have a couple of workshop items, and I'm going to, without objection from the council, move those to a little later so that we can go ahead and begin to uh, recognize people that have um, come today. So I'm going to move us to citizens' presentations. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity for citizens to address the council on any matter whether or not it is posted on the agenda. The council is not permitted to take action on or discuss any presentations made to the council at this time concerning an item not listed on the agenda. The council will hear presentations on specific agenda items prior to the council addressing those items. You may speak up to four minutes or a time limit de determined by the mayor or presiding officer. To speak during this item, you must complete the speaker's form that indicates the topics of your statement. Topics of presentation should be limited to matters over which the council has authority. Holly, has anyone signed up to speak this evening? No, sir. All right. Anyone in the audience wishing to address the council? All right. We will then uh, move to our consent agenda, items three to six. All matters listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine by the town council and will be enacted by one motion. There will not be a separate discussion of these items. If discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Council, does anyone wish to remove any of the items? Hearing none, I will read the items. Item three, consider and take appropriate action regarding the minutes dated March 24th, 2014. Consider and take appropriate action regarding the minutes dated January 13, 2015. Consider and take appropriate action regarding the minutes dated February 24th, 2015. Consider and take appropriate action regarding financial and variance report dated February 2015. I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion to approve consent agenda items three, four, five, and six. Do you have a second? Second. I do have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Lamont and a second by Council Member Reed. All in favor, show your hands. All opposed, same sign. No opposed, it is unanimous. Our regular session agenda, item number seven, recognition of Chuck and Diane Hall for their years of service provided to the town of Trophy Club, uh, the presentation of a certificate of resignation uh, to Chuck. So just a minute, I have a few things to uh, recognition, recognition. Rec and a plaque. So we'll have something here. Well, I did have something. Where'd it go? Here again. So a little history 
Where, Chuck, where are you? I've lost you. You're way in the back. So Chuck and Diane, come up to the front row. I know you're back there. <coughs> and I won't make you stand during this, but if you would, uh, take a seat. Chuck and Diane both attended Purdue University in Indiana, and there it's where they met. They married soon after graduation, and as of April, have been partners, best friends, and married for 47 years. That alone should get a certificate, shouldn't it? <laughs> we lived in the Midwest, not far from Chicago. Diane had a varied career in advertising, law, human resources, and public affairs. Chuck graduated uh, in an electrical engineering and worked in development of new systems for general tele telephone and electronics. In 1995, GTE Labs was sold and their headquarters relocated to Las Colinas. That's when they moved to Texas and his responsibilities changed to project management. They looked for houses for over a month, viewing over 150 homes, while Diane sold the snowblowers. I was supposed to say she sold the snowblowers. Okay, you are from Indiana. Okay, you didn't want to bring those down here? Okay. She sold the snowblowers and wrapped things up in Indiana. Then a new agent took me to Trophy Club. The homes here have a great variety. There are hills and trees, just what we wanted, and within two days we had found our home and community. Our neighbors welcomed us into the community, and we became honorary Texans. In 2000, we retired and moved to a new phase of life. The Mud Newsletter arrived with the bill and an ad for someone to record town council meetings. I interviewed and explained that we would not be in town all the time, as we planned on some travel. The manager said, fine, and uh, we can work with you, and that wouldn't be a problem. They started in 2001, and Chuck has served uh, for four mayors, and one mayor twice in two sections. Um, and all of the time back in our audiovisual room, and so the, most of the time no one knew he was there, um, and had the challenge of trying to deal with the technology. Uh, as he said, when council changed, someone would speak, and he would try to figure out who was speaking so he could get the camera on them. So uh, just to let everybody know, it wasn't that easy uh, to get that done. Looking back, they realized that this was a track to smooth, uh, smoothly move into full retirement, and it was a great help with the consideration uh, of flexible hours um, a very considerate and flexible Trophy Club IT department, town staff and council, it was fun to work here. So I have a, a certificate that says, and I'm going to bring it down there in just a second, presented to Chuck Hall in recognition of your dedication and excellent audiovisual service from 2001 to 2015 for the town of Trophy Club, Texas. From all of us on the town council and all of the citizens that watched all of those um, shows, and I'm sure y'all are going to go home and watch one of these council meetings sometime, aren't you, that are so excited or listen to the audio, we thank you for your service. Let's congratulate him. Picture, so I'm going to come down for presentation and council if you want to come with me if you want to yeah. file down there let's go right. let's get this one way or the other First of all, uh, it really is our pleasure to recognize you. Uh, the years that you served and made sure that everything happened appropriately are valuable to this town. And we hate to see you go. Um, seldom knew that you were necessarily back there unless I said, Chuck, are we ready? And uh, the lights would blink or you would wave at me. So on behalf of the Town of Trophy Club, 
We thank you for your years of service. Let's get a picture. Right when I can't see you. Move around, everybody can get to see you. All right, one, two. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, perfect. You absolutely can, but you're going to have to come to the microphone. You know that, right? <laughs> I'm just going to say a couple words, and that is uh, once we got cameras with joysticks so we could control them, Diana became the joystick operator, and it was hard to get her away from them. It was like trying to take the remote away from a guy. The other thing that I want to say is um, it's been a pleasure, and I'm just so grateful that everyone here volunteers and makes the extreme effort towards this town, especially our town council and all the people that work on committees, groups, and so forth to support this community. It's what makes it great, and I encourage all of you to do the same thing. There's one other thing, and then I'm going to leave, and that is I've never been able to leave before the executive session, which sometimes goes till 2 in the morning. And we're, I'm going to say goodbye, and we're going to leave right now. So thank you. <laughs> hey, uh, Chuck, just, Chuck, Chuck, just a minute before you leave. The officer's back there. Would you please escort him to the front row and make sure he stays through executive session? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Thanks, Chuck. Appreciate it. Um. We're not going until 2 this morning, are we, Mr. Brown? No. <laughs> no, we're not going to go to 2. <laughs> Item number 8. One. Receive presentation from Byron Nelson High School Virtual Enterprise International Students, VEI. Discussion and presentation of Certificate of Recognition for the group's achievement as the first team in Texas to advance to the national <coughs> and global competitions uh, for high school business management programs. Council, I believe they have a presentation first, so I'll let you make your presentation if that's what you're going to do, students. And if you do come to the microphone, please introduce yourselves. Thank you. Uh, before they begin, uh, thank you very much, Mayor Sanders and members of the council. Uh, for everybody that may not be familiar with this team, uh, this is the Byron Nelson High School uh, business competition team. They will be competing uh, April 12th at Nationals. Uh, they've been competing with 8,500 other high schools across the world. Um, they are the first year firm to ever make it to Nationals. Um, it's unheard of. What you will see, what they're holding today is the, um, the six top three awards that they received at regionals. Uh, the presentation that you will see is their company that they created uh, from complete scratch, their hard work and their dedication. Uh, what you will hear, it may sound a bit um, overpriced, is because um, everything that is happening happens in a virtual uh, enterprise, in a wholesale marketplace where they set their own prices and they set their own uh, market shares and such, um, and they compete with these 8,500 different uh, companies. So, Antonio, would you introduce yourself? For the oh, record? yes. Uh, I'm Antonio Banos. I'm the uh, facilitator and coordinator for this team, um, and I'm very blessed to have had the chance and opportunity to teach these wonderful kids. All right. Thank you. Please go to the microphone if you can when you speak so we get it recorded. Thank you. Move these this way. Yes, let me face this way so you can face both. Let the audience face it this way. Face it this way. Don't give it back to anybody. Okay. <laughs> Are you good? Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and start. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here today and taking the time to listen to us. My name is Ashlyn Murphy, and I'm the Chief Sales Officer for Life's Purity. We're a small town organic tea brewery based out of Trophy Club, Texas, with big dreams, hopes, and aspirations, not only to provide the highest quality product to our customers, but to also make an impact on this world. With me, I have a team of socially responsible, passionate individuals, representing not only a team, but a family of 21 tea-loving people. 
We were fed up with having to sacrifice taste and our health to find an alternative to tasteless water and sugary drinks. This is our family. Hi, I'm Samantha Mullins, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer. Hi, I'm Hannah Ricketts, and I'm the Chief Creative Officer. Hi, I'm Bianca Santana, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer. Hi, I'm Scott Travis, and I'm the Chief Strategic Officer and helping us out with technology, as I was saying. Like Ashlyn said, life's purity began as a necessity to find a more healthy, wholesome, and nutritious alternative to tasteless water and sugary drinks. We wanted a beverage with all of the taste, but without all the fake ingredients and artificial sweeteners. Through extensive primary and secondary research, we discovered that there is a large demand for us in the VEI wholesale marketplace. As outlined in this chart, our SWOT analysis helped us further explore our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Our market and industry analysis has indicated that as of today, we are the leading brand in organic beverages. We have identified our direct and indirect competition as shown here. Our direct competition is Jordalius Organic Tea and Coffee. Our indirect competition is Berry Light and Wired Coffee. Nobody really offers a beverage quite like Pure Tea. Taking this information, we discovered our target market. Our primary target market, which we labeled Proactive Company, are VEI companies with 10 or more employees operating within the VEI wholesale marketplace in any industry other than the beverage sector. Our secondary target market, which we labeled Cindy and Josh, are VEI companies with VEI employees working within VEI companies with an age range of 16 to 18 <coughs> with an annual salary of $45,000 to $100,000 seeking a healthier, more nutritious alternative to tasteless water and sugary drinks. Our target market is located in the most populated areas as shown here. We've had great success. We are the leading brand in organic beverages. So far, we are leading the movement. We're making it happen. I'll now have Bianca talk to you about our structure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Here at Life's Purity, we currently hold the legal status of an S corporation. Our mission is to provide and deliver refreshing, organic, ready-to-drink teas made with only the most natural and wholesome ingredients, basically the way Mother Earth intended them to be. As for our vision, we strive to become the leading brand of healthy, organic beverages worldwide. As you can see, we have a tier level management system that allows for us to perform in the most efficient way possible. Because of this, we are able to maintain a safe and fun environment for all of our employees, or as we call ourselves, our family. Our senior leadership is currently broken up into three separate groups, followed by our VPs and team members. Much like our farmers and customers, our employees are always top priority. That is why we have set in place an open communication system that encourages both personal and professional development. In fact, our Human Resources Department has done an outstanding job in advocating and implementing a workplace revolved around a family-friendly culture. However, these practices are further outlined in our employee handbook. But enough about the corporate structure. Let's talk about our tea. Hannah? Thank you, Bianca. Our tea is organic, which means we use only the most wholesome ingredient free of pesticides and damaging chemicals. Our tea is also non-GMO, meaning that none of the ingredients are genetically modified. They come straight from Mother Earth, right into the bottle. We are also fair trade certified because we care about our farmers. Through this global certification, we can provide better wages and support better farming practices to increase the standard of their everyday lives. Our tea is also kosher and gluten-free. In addition to this, what truly makes Life Pure Tea different from any other beverage company out there is that in our tea, instead of using artificial sweeteners or even just cane sugar, we use pure, raw honey. Samantha will now talk to you about our current line of organic teas. Thank you, Hannah. We currently have eight different organic teas, with our two signature flavors being our green tea and our black tea. Our black tea is a delicious blend of healthy yet flavorful ingredients that will set your senses free. And our green tea is naturally infused with rich organic ingredients and spring water that work to relieve daily stress. We are, since the month of February, we have released six new bottles of tea. These teas include an unsweetened version of our green and black tea, a BB tea, a blueberry tea, a cranberry tea, and a lemonade tea. We buy most of our ingredients in bulk, and through a proprietary heating and cooling method, we're able to streamline our products and our process in a very lean and efficient way. I'll now have Ashlyn talk to you about the process and the company as a whole. 
Thank you, Samantha. This diagram gives you a bird's eye view of our product description and processes further explained in our business plan. A big challenge starting as a brand new firm in Texas, where there's currently just one other firm, made it a bit challenging to break even in the beginning. But after cutting costs, adjusting salaries, streamlining our process, and solving a shipping situation, we were able to establish a very realistic break-even point, around $82,000, which equates to about 12,000 bottles of tea. Our cash flow therefore increased, which allowed us to drop prices and increase profits. Unfortunately, in the month of December, we're in the process of switching from a cash to an accurate method of accounting. We also experienced some technology difficulties, not being able to access our portal or email for about three weeks. Since January, we have fixed all of that, and our financial plan now reflects our new financial strategy. As a matter of fact, since January, we have had an 11% increase in sales, which will allow us to be truly profitable by the end of May. As of today, we have made more than $400,000. Shipping was another big challenge for us. Thankfully, we were able to secure a partnership with a third-party logistics company that picks up our product and stores it in their climate warehouse reefers. Here's a breakdown of our pricing strategy. Like Ashlyn said, after the month of January, our pricing strategy was revised to allow the same price for all eight bottles of tea. As you can tell, we have accounted for everything into our price per bottle, and the cost to produce our tea is $1.37, and it is sold at a retail price of $6.85 per bottle. After conducting extensive research and based on the current demand, as well as the economic environment of the wholesale marketplace, we have strategically set our profit margins. For our six-pack, our price markup is 400%, and for our 60-pack, our price markup is 350%. After conducting real-world and industry research, we saw that tea in our category had an average price markup of 300%. But based on the economic environment of the wholesale marketplace, as mentioned before, we were able to raise our price markup to better suit our financial goals, while keeping the best interests of our shareholders and our customers. Within our pricing strategy, we've taken potential risk factors into consideration. Even though tea is recession-proof, as stated in the latest economic and financial journals, we have a contingency plan and budget set in place to our product, our brand, and our shareholders if need be. This has not been the case in over 20 years. I'll now have Hannah and Scott talk to you about our brand. Thank you, Sam. Our bottles and packaging are both aesthetically pleasing and clearly convey simplicity and quality. The integrated marketing campaign is cost-effective, measurable, and targeted. We have taken strategic steps to make sure that our brand truly reflects our mission, vision, and core values. Our logo, for instance, was carefully crafted with our mission in mind. The three water drops represent our company, the farmers, and the consumers, and how life purity brings them all together. The three leaves represent how tea is organic, non-GMO, and fair trade certified. Our e-commerce website, vepurity.com, clearly shows everything from who we are to how we became that company today. With the increase in search engine optimization, SEO, through the use of our ads and blogs, we are able to drive more traffic to our website. In order to create awareness for our brand, we use advertisements and promotions through our social media. We use apps such as Twitter and YouTube to really connect with our target market. Along with advertisements, promotions were used to not only give customers great deals, but to be able to track the level of traffic being pushed to our website. Finally, we secured a partnership with LifeStraw. LifeStraw is a nonprofit company that uses a filtration straw that allows people to drink from places they can't normally drink from, such as rivers, streams, and even muddy water. For every bottle of pure tea that's sold, 33 cents goes towards LifeStraw. For every 60 bottles we sell, a live straw is donated to a country in need. Thank you, guys. As you can see, what started an adventure seeking an alternative to tasteless water and sugary drinks has turned into reality. Thanks to a wonderful group of people who care about what they do and who they do it for, we were able to brew a socially responsible tea company that cares about its farmers, employers, customers, and the world. We are very happy to be here sharing our company and our vision with you. We hope you enjoyed our presentation, and we thank you for your time. At this moment, we would like to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council, let's give them some tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> where in Greg? Well, we knew that Greg would ask. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, two things. Uh, where in uh, the New York City area will the uh, <coughs> event be held? Go ahead, <laughs> the event is actually at the Microsoft 
location in Manhattan. We are actually staying in Chelsea, though. Okay. I'm going to give you a little advice. <laughs> Whether you ask for it or not. I, I was born and raised in New York City, and sometimes that city can be very intimidating. But you have to remember something, that you're going to see thousands of people walking around, and they may seem cold and aloof. The reality is that walking in Manhattan is a mode of transportation. Uh, picture yourself walking or driving on 114. You wouldn't drive in the wrong direction. You wouldn't stop the car and say to somebody behind you, hi, how you doing? Or you wouldn't expect them to say, how's your family? How's Uncle Walter doing? <laughs> how can I get to the Empire State Building? So just bear that in mind. And the other thing is half the people are tourists. They might not even speak English and they don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so, but have fun. It's a great city. It's the greatest city in the world. The only problem is you can't retire there. <laughs> Much easier to retire in Texas. Anybody else have questions for him? No, but I, ho I hope you paid close attention that all of the tea was on a pallet. So, just, just <laughs> <laughs> on a pallet. I, I, angling for some service. <laughs> Philip is the pallet king of the Great Southwest. In case anyone was wondering, uh, can you can you guys give us just a little bit of background on what VEI is and how this marketplace functions, and to what degree the things that you're showing us are. Um, physically real versus virtual? Because I think it would help set the context for what it is you've done here in this project. Well, to make it plain and simple, VEI is the most realistic in-classroom business experience you could possibly have. As you can see, we have every single aspect of what a company needs to bring, to bring a product out to the, the consumer. And what it does is it allows students to have <laughs> full experiences in branches and leadership positions as employees, allows them to truly really understand how to create a product and how to develop it, how to manage and work with students, and what help, what another aspect of, another aspect of what it allows us to do is it allows us to really be able to work with other people. That's one of the main things I've learned personally from it, is being able to problem solve with another person and being able to work as a group, as a team, or like we said, as a family. Y'all mentioned in your presentation um, some obstacles that occurred. Uh, email, I think, was one. It might have been a shipping issue or something like that. Are those obstacles that are given to you by your instructors at school or those obstacles that you came up with yourself? How Are, are, are curveballs thrown to you during this process of things that come up? Well, actually, the, the economy and the way things work within the classroom is all created by ourselves and other companies. No, nothing is stimulated within it or put into it. Everything that happens within the program, within the, the classroom, like I said, happens because of us and other companies. So it like, seems like technology issues because of the school district and the Wi-Fi that we experience and the blocks that students have on the Wi-Fi. But things like the shipping situation is just a real company. We had to figure out how to ship the product virtually, technically, to places like California and New York from Texas. Because we are, other than the Northwest team, we are the only firm in Texas. Any other questions? Very impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. Does the audience have any questions? <laughs> um, I would just like to say that is one of the best business presentations I've ever heard. <laughs> it was a great one. <laughs> At any age. <laughs> At any age, it was Thank great. You. Thank you. I want to look back. Oh, yeah. The forecast was they made $4 million. Is that what the deal is? <laughs> okay. All right, I got one more question up here, I think. Uh, well, two things. Uh, how old do you have to be to serve on EDC? <laughs> That's Economic Development Corporation. <laughs> the other thing I noticed, you said when you ran into a problem, you cut costs and salaries. Mm -hmm. You will do very well in the private sector. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much in the public sector. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Uh, in recognition of outstanding achievements, including winning six awards at the regional competition, becoming the first team in Texas to achieve, to advance to the nationals and competing in the Global Business Challenge, Business Plan Competition, and International Trade Show at the International Youth Business Summit in New York City, on behalf of the Town Council of Trophy Club and all the citizens here that are proud of you, congratulations and want to present you with this plaque. So we're going to come around and get a few pictures. So council once again.
So let's get a picture. Uh, can y'all spread a little bit? It's right here. Okay. So I don't want to block anybody in the picture. Okay. So can you get everybody? Tell me if you can. Okay. All right. Everybody smile. Did you get the plaque over the podium? Yes. Jessica, congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much. Wait a minute, we had somebody there. We had two people stand in the audience that didn't get in. Congratulations. See, the CEO, did y'all get that? The CEO sat back and left them for a minute. Congratulations. The kids. Guys, we've got water bottles for you. Water bottles. You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, like one of these trucks and pickup trucks. Yeah, this one is. This one is. This is no sugar. All the GMOs. I really want to see it. Whoops. All right. One final note about this uh, presentation that you saw and what Byron Nelson High School put together. This was a pilot program. You can see it did very well. And the program's going to move from Byron Nelson High School to Eaton uh, next year. Uh, so it'll go to a different location, different high school, uh, maybe bigger, at least in the sense of uh, size, than Byron Nelson, which is hard to imagine. Uh, but uh, congratulations to all of you and all the parents. Thank you for coming out tonight uh, to the presentation. And April 14th, is that the date? All right, so we expect some tweets, some <laughs> Facebook posts, and some emails with pictures about all of this. All right? So congratulations. Thank you very much for coming. Then can somebody print them out and deliver them to me? <laughs> Y'all are welcome to stay the remainder of the meeting but I recognize you may not want to. <laughs> so, yes, uh, they need to tear down. So we'll take a, f a few minute break while they get a chance to kind of organize their stuff before we go forward. So council will be in recess for five minutes at 7.35. So if you will come back to order, it is uh, 7.38. Uh, we are back from recess. Uh, we just finished the presentation from the VEI students. Without objection, I'm going to move down the agenda a little bit further, uh, and we'll still come back to those um, uh, first items. Item number nine, recognition of members of town staff for services provided to the town during the winter weather days and discussion of sa same. Stephen, I know we've got some, uh, some of the people here tonight. Uh, would you introduce them, have them come up? And uh, then people maybe that aren't here that were involved in some of that effort, you can mention them also. Absolutely. We have almost, uh, well, first let me lead off by saying uh, thank you, Council, for the opportunity to recognize our employees uh, and the service that they provide each and every day, uh, but also during uh, instances where there's inclement weather or disaster situations. Um, obviously, police and fire get a lot of recognition for that, and they do a lot, and they're here 24-7. But there's also employees that work for various departments that um, we deem as critical employees when there is such situations like ice, snow, um, any type of, we've had tornadoes, those types of things where we've called them in, and they've been here and left their families even when we're closed to make sure that the town is safe and that the employees, when they come to work, are are coming to a safe environment 
and I, this is an opportunity for us to recognize those employees who um, you know watch over the town watch over the staff watch over the council the volunteers and the citizens the businesses uh, it's a really a great opportunity and and uh, I can't thank them enough for what they do each and every day uh, so I want to make sure that I get the folks who are here uh, and recognize them I'm from the fire department um, I, I think we had a couple of shifts between the ice and but tonight is a shift right and uh, Tonight, they're going to be rec they're, we're recognizing a shift for the entire fire department. And with that, we have Captain Shane Beck, driver operator Sean Garrett, um, paramedic, firefighter paramedic Dwayne Bone, oh, Boone, sorry, and uh, firefighter paramedic Matthew Tackett. And from the police department, we have uh, Lieutenant Shields, we have Officer Brian Gluck, and Officer. Um, um, oh, Beatler, Edward Beatler, Ed <laughs> Beatler, sorry, drew a blank, and then Sergeant Wes Tyler. Uh, from the streets department, we have uh, Ed Helton, uh, Raul Cordero, or Peanut, and uh, Isaac, I don't think Isaac's here tonight. Um, and then from parks department, we have uh, Sergio Vargas, uh, Tony Jaramillo, and Adam is here. Uh, but we have another person, Jorge Guzman, who is not here this evening. I didn't see him. Uh, that, that all provided service. And this may be either patrolling. We had, at one point on the first day, we had an, a moving truck that was jackknifed on Indian Creek that we had to try to get unstuck. Uh, they're out there sanding the intersections, clearing the sidewalks um, in front of the public buildings, uh, trying to get those hot spots in towns when they find a a person who was sliding out and couldn't get traction, they pull over, try to get them going and, and back on their way in a, safe, uh, in, in a safe and efficient manner. So if they would come up, I'd just like to recognize, recognize them and, and shake their hand. Mayor? They'll come up. Y'all seats out there, yeah. <laughs> or give you a break in this thing, yeah. <laughs> you know what? Hold on. Two people that I need to make sure are our two chiefs, Danny Thomas and Chief Patrick Arada. Uh, they provide the leadership for the public safety and they also are instrumental during emergency situations whether it's ice snow wind hail whatever they're always on duty with these folks uh, they provide emergency management and they're a big part of our leadership team within our town so thank you guys y'all come up here on the stage come on up here taller guys in the back shorter guys up front like me <laughs> Yeah, I know. Some of us are shorter. It's way better. It's not going to be a back row. They're not. It's <laughs> <laughs> not going to be a back row. I love it. Garrett can be in the back row, right? Yeah, get back, get back. Philip can be in the back row. Adam, come down, Adam. You, you were in spot, right? We get everybody in our picture. Now, those of you. All right, can, all right, those of you who are kind of in the back, make sure you're in between so we can get you in a picture. All right, everybody. We need to have like a uh, some sort of sign like. Oh, don't worry, I'll Photoshop it. <laughs> I 
that's just a couple votes away. I went through the budget. Depends how they write the law. Oh yeah. It's just a question of where you can carry it. Is it going to be restricted like it is now under concealed carry, or is it going to have the same restrictions? You didn't want everybody to wait. Because they're going to Jennifer have colleges now. They're going to be able to carry. I know, and that was one of the things I was Which has previously been off limits. Okay. So. All right, council. <laughs> uh, item number 10, consider and take appropriate action regarding a proclamation of the town of Trophy Club during April 15, 2015, as Arbor Day and Trophy Club. Uh, I'll recognize Council Member Perro to read the proclamation and for a motion. Town of Trophy Club Proclamation Number 2015-06, a proclamation of the Town Council of the Town of Trophy Club, Texas, to recognize April 25, 2015 as Arbor Day, recognizing that 2015 is the 143rd anniversary of the holiday of Arbor Day and providing an effective date. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees, and whereas this holiday called Arbor Day was first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska, and whereas 2015 is the 143rd anniversary of the holiday, and Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world, and whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce life-giving oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife. And whereas trees are a renewable resource giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and beautify our community, and whereas trees, wherever they are planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal, now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Town Council of the Town of Trophy Club, Texas, Section 1, in the Town of Trophy Club, the Mayor and Council urge all citizens to celebrate Arbor Day and to support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands. And Section 2, the Mayor and Council urge all citizens to plant trees to gladden the heart and promote the well-being of this and future generations. Passed and approved by the Town Council of the Town of Trophy Club, Texas, this 24th day of March 2015. And considering that uh, for the past 10 years, the Town of Trophy Club has been certified and designated as Tree City, this is a very appropriate proclamation to make. And I motion that the Council pass this unanimously. Do you have a second? I'll second. Tim Kurtz seconds. Any discussion? All in favor, show your hands. All opposed, same sign. No opposed. It is unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, if I will, I think. If uh, you will. Yes. On behalf of the council, we would like to welcome back Mr. Stephen Glickman. Thank you. Stephen, welcome back. <laughs> you want a picture? <laughs> okay. As you can tell, this group is a little nuts, I think. Okay. Item number 11, presentation from Trophy Club Municipal Utility District Number 1, General Manager Jennifer McDyke, regarding Texas Commission on Environmental <coughs> Quality, TCEQ, rules and violations and discussion of same. same. Jennifer, would you take the podium, please? And I think you have a presentation for us. Yes, I do. And I will work on getting that up. And um, want to say thank you all for having me. I want to point out something I noticed tonight. I think this is about the third or fourth time that I've been invited to come and speak to the council right after a very smart group of BNH, uh, BNHS students. And I just want to say that if you're trying to prove that I'm not as smart as a 12th grader, <laughs> point made. I get it. Every time it's been an exceptional group, and I hate to have to follow them. So. Uh, but I've wanted to come tonight and talk a little bit about um, the district. We did get a notice of violation from the TCQ. Uh, this was related to, we originally, the TCQ came out to the, the wastewater plant 
uh, responding to a citizen's complaint, a citizen's odor complaint. And when they came out, one of the things that they noticed was that our mechanical bar screen was, was down. And it was actually time for our three-year inspection anyway. So they let us know that they were going to come back later in the week and do the full-blown inspection. And so they did. And so when the, when the TCEQ comes out and does this inspection of the wastewater plant, it's usually about every two or three years, and they look at the, uh, the past two to three years of all of your records, all of your um, documentation. They look back be from the, the previous time that they did an inspection. So as they looked through our records, they found some things that, although they were reported, when they do the inspection, they write them up as an alleged violation. So I want to go through first the things that were, when they left the, the, the plant, they were outstanding, and what we've done to correct those issues. Um, all of the other remaining things in my presentation are, were resolved at the time that they, they came out. All right, the first item was that our mechanical bar screen was inoperable. And um, I like to compare this mechanical bar screen to my 72 Mercury Monarch that I drove in college. Over time, I replaced every part to the car, and it still didn't run very well. That's about how this mechanical bar screen has been since I've worked here. I just don't think there's anything left we can replace on it. But at the time that they came out, the, um, there was a, a gearbox that was down. We had it on order for a, about nine weeks. It took about nine weeks for us to get it in. Um, it did finally get here, and it was put into uh, – repaired the, the day that it was received, and the mechanical bar screen is now operational. They asked that we send a video of it operating, and that, that is what we did. This is just a snapshot, but you can see that the, that the um, grinder is spinning. It, it is working. What, what does it do? <laughs> it, um, when just curious. I'll get to another picture in a minute that's a manual bar screen, and it's when large pieces of trash come into the plant, to the head of the plant, this piece of equipment pulls that out before it goes on through the treatment. And there's just lots of stuff that gets that gets stuck in, in it. You would never believe the things that people somehow flush down their toilet that end up coming into the, the wastewater plant. Very large items. I have to go items, home and take so a shower. Shouldn't amazing. have asked. Sorry. <laughs> um, they also found that there was a gap in the, the manual bar screen. And I'm going to be very honest with you, I could not tell the difference between the before and the after picture. But this picture is the after picture, and what, what the deal was was this, the screen had moved over to the left about a half an, a half an inch to an inch. It was not centered down the, down the, the, the canal that, it, it, that you see there in the picture. So it was just a matter of loosening it up and moving it back into place. That was taken care of immediately, and we have added this to our daily checklist. Every day they're checking that manual bar screen to make sure that it is still in the right location that it's supposed to be. Uh, the third item that was outstanding was that there were screenings in the, in the basin or debris, and um, that there was foaming. Um, this is a problem that we've had. Uh, we have an ongoing problem with the foaming, and that is something that is going to be uh, corrected when we get the new wastewater treatment plant online. So for now, what we do is we, we work as hard as we can to keep the foam down. At times, we have to actually skim it off with the vac truck. But that is a, a problem for our correctional steps. We have just sub resubmitted to them our compliance schedule. And they, they are fully aware of all the issues that we, we've gone through to, to try to get our bonds issued, and they are working with us. I don't think that this is something they weren't aware of, but the last time when they came out, we had foaming issues as well. So when you get the same, the same issue twice, they're, they're definitely going to look at that a little more seriously. Um, 
the next item, they stated that there was some weeds and um, actually it was our tomato plant garden and our watermelons out in the, the drying beds that um, they do, weeds do grow up there. In the wintertime, we don't really use the drying beds. We do use them sometimes in the, in the summertime. The purpose of the drying bed, we also have a belt press that, that squeezes the water out of the sludge because the amount we pay to haul sludge off depends on the weight. So you want to get all that wa as much water out as you can. But in the wintertime, using the drying beds when it's wet and rainy doesn't really help to use a drying bed. So they will get weeds and things grown in there, and they did find a few. So that was, um, we, we pulled all the weeds out, and th again, they have that on a weekly checklist now to, to make sure that weeds don't grow up in there. That's the uh, other two drying beds. The final outstanding issue was that there was um, excessive scum and flock, and again, that is uh, caused by inadequate treatment capacity at the plant. You can see the flock that's floating on the top of the clarifier here. Um, we skimmed off as much as we could, but again, that is something that, that is just because we're beyond the treatment capacity of the plant. There's not a lot we can do about that. Um, quickly, I'll go through the other issues that they wrote us up for that, that were resolved at the time they came out. Um, we kind of got a two-for-one um, on our ammonia nitrogen excursion that we had in May of 2014. The sample re result was 1.78. And milligrams per liter, our discharge permit limit at that time is one milligram per liter. So, of course, it exceeded the permit limit. So we were, we were uh, reported that in our discharge monitoring report as a violation. But we're also required when the, when the exceedance exceeds 40% of, goes 40% more than your discharge limit, that is an additional violation. So if it's above 1.4, it's a second violation, and in this case it was. And there is a report form that has to be submitted. It's a water quality noncompliance notification, and it is for a reportable effluent violation. That form also was submitted to TCQ. Uh, the next item that was resolved when they came out were, uh, was a unauthorized discharges or what we call SSOs, sanitary sewer overflows. These are very common. Um, there are thousands and thousands of these reported all over the United States every month. Um, it's usually caused by grease in your collection system and it will cause a stoppage in the system and sewage will overflow from a manhole. Um, in the first case, the, f the first SSO that we were written up for was actually at a lift station caused by a power surge. And the power surge caused our pumps uh, to trip off and we did not get an alarm and uh, some of the, the sewer went off on over into the ground. Um, <clears throat> the, other, uh, the next SSO was on April 7th of 2013 and it was a stoppage in a sewer line due to grease. And the final was an SSO in September, I believe. No, I'm sorry, August. And it was caused by, also by a line stoppage causing an overflow in a manhole. Uh, the final thing that they commented on, it was not, it's not a violation. It is not even a requirement. But they did ask that we would start submitting our annual sludge reports to the regional office as well as to the, the Austin headquarters. So we have, of course, we will start doing that. Um, that is the, the violation notice that we received. And um, rest assured, everything that we could possibly correct <laughs> has been corrected. And we're, um, as of the end of this week on Thursday, we will be taking the bids for the wastewater treatment plant upgrade. So we're really excited about that. We're actually headed down the road. We're gonna start seeing things. You all will um, soon be getting a, an invitation to come turn dirt in our nice cleaned out uh, drying beds. We'll go out there with a the shovel and turn dirt for our, our opening of our, our groundbreaking of our new treatment plant. 
Do you all have any questions? I have one. Jim? Uh, with the upgrade to the new wastewater plant, will the issue with the grease buildup that caused the unauthorized discharges be addressed in a, in a more ongoing way to minimize those unauthorized discharges, or will that be another piece of equipment to be added later? Well, th that is in the collection system out in the sewers out all over the, the city. That isn't really at the, at the wastewater treatment plant. Okay. And um, we do try to, um, we, we check the manholes regularly. We, um, we pump the grease that, that goes to lift stations. We try to go and collect that on a, a monthly basis. Um, in the wintertime, it gets worse than the summertime because, you know, as it, the weather's colder, the grease solidifies. In the summertime, it kind of stays liquid and it goes on through the system. But to answer your question, no, the plant upgrade won't really help that because it's when grease gets caught in the collection system coming in from people's homes. And um, I can say that, that Trophy Club doesn't have the problems of some, some other areas that I've lived. I lived at the beach, and everybody goes to the beach, and they want to have a big shrimp boil and then they or a, a shrimp fry, and then they want to dump that shrimp down the, the sink. They don't realize that that leads to big clogs in the sewer system. So every, every collection system is going to have problems. In the city of Houston, a lot of restaurants cause problems. So Trophy Club, are, ours are really minimal compared to other areas, but but I think you'll always have grease in the collection system, unfortunately. Jennifer, oh, go ahead. Councilmember Lamar. I hear you're right. Did you say you grow watermelons? Is that a metaphor for something else, I hope? <laughs> no, we really, watermelons and tomatoes grow in those drying beds. The seeds come through the, the system and they blow out into the area around. Any wastewater treatment plant you go to, you'll find Just lots of very organic fruits anymore. and vegetables. Great for Yummy. tea. <laughs> There's a little produce stand. <laughs> They're opening a produce stand Fully right next organic. to the plant uh, next year. That's Jennifer, really the first commercial. Com I don't think that soil. fits pure a tea. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, thank you very much for coming sure. and making the presentation. Uh, and glad that we're uh, the bids are going out this week and look forward to hopefully those coming in under estimate and Me too. moving forward. Me too. Um, there was one item uh, I don't think was in your presentation where uh, one of the contractors did something that caused a spill. Is that right? That yes. I don't um, think that was covered unless I missed it. No, that was not. Um, actually, that happened That's the, the, like the day after TCEQ came out for that inspection, the overflow that you're talking about, that's when that occurred. And it was a developer had installed a sewer line and he did not, the, the contractor did not cover it well. And if you recall, it, it came a rain there at the end of January and it caused that sewer line to float up and break. And it was under uh, where there was a big drainage area. It was basically under what looked like a lake. And it wasn't until the, the lake drained, it took us really two days to figure out where this huge flow was coming into the plant. We were the guys were going all over town, both water and wastewater guys. I was out actually walking around with them trying to, to see if we could find from manhole to manhole. Well, when the lake finally kind of drained down, we saw this pipe sticking up. And as upon further investigation, the, the pipe had broke and that lake had basically drained into the wastewater plant and flooded out the plant. So that is a concern probably for our next inspection. <laughs> it was all reported, but they'll be looking at that next time. So I'll make sure it's corrected. Right? Yes. There'll be a home over it next time, maybe, or something. Who yeah. knows? <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Anybody else have a question? Did the developer wind up reimbursing the town for all the time and effort it went to fixing their problem? Yes, we did receive a check from the uh, contractor's insurance, and we're still working on them uh, for an agreement. We are asking them to give us uh, – to put up $35,000 um, for a period of at least three years in case we are fined at a later date. So we're working on that agreement with them right now. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you very much for coming tonight. Thanks. Sorry you had to wait. Appreciate it.
All right, Council, I'm going to go to uh, item 13 because we have people that are going to be presenting to us there, and they've been waiting a good while. Consider and take appropriate action regarding the 2014-2015 capital improvement project street reconstruction of Pebble Beach Drive, Timberline Court, Pin Oak Court, and Cypress Court, approving the authorization for professional services between the town, Tignall and Perkins, and authorizing the town manager, his designee, to execute all necessary documents for professional services. So after the presentation uh, from Tom Rutledge of Tignall and Perkins, uh, we will be looking for a motion authorizing the town manager to execute appropriate documents for the expenditures. Tom, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mayor, Council, and Stephen, glad to be here tonight. <coughs> Uh, Mike Wilson's here with me tonight. Mike's uh, my project manager on this, and <clears throat> we're going to team up a little bit on this presentation. Uh, we met a, a week ago today uh, with uh, staff to give them a, what we call a 75% review of, of the design plans. Uh, back in, Stephen, you'll have to help me with this part, when we developed the CIP, I don't remember when we actually developed that budget, I think it was July, last July, July of, of 2014. Last year. So July of last year, uh, Stephen asked us to assist him in developing uh, streets that Ed had identified that wanted to be uh, reconstructed and approved and develop budgets for that. <laughs> And so uh, we used the information we had available through aerials and town records and maps uh, to determine what our best assessment would be for the cost of those. And so when we did that, <clears throat> we, um, I'll come back to this in just a minute. When we did that, we came up with uh, a line item of, of several of the streets, and these are three of the streets, Timberline, Pin Oak, and Pebble Beach. Uh, that Stephen chose to be on this next round of streets. So what you have in front of you is what we show as, uh, there's a column here of the estimated cost for those three streets, uh, and those are our estimated costs based on the 75% design plans. And so we have actual quantities and design information uh, that allow us to develop what, what we've determined are the current uh, estimated costs. Of course, we haven't bid it, uh, but we, uh, we feel good about those numbers. The column to the right is the CIP budget, which Stephen had brought to council that you guys that were working off of. And so as we, you can see that <clears throat> based on our design estimated cost and what the budget number is, we're under the budget, which is always a good thing. And as always for you guys, as we're going through any design, we're always updating our estimates to, to see if anything comes up, and then we communicate that to staff. Then the second group there are the engineering fees uh, that we, we developed there um, underneath the estimated cost as well. And so those are less. And the, and the reason those are less for a couple of reasons. One, on the engineering fees, what I lear learned as we went through this uh, for example, on the Pin Oak Court, uh, we had budgeted in there to have some storm drain replaced in the CIP. When we got in there and looked at it, storm drain is fine, and we don't have to do anything to the storm drain system. So that means our efforts less, and so felt like it was the right thing to do for us to adjust our fees accordingly to what our effort would be. And so that's why that's there. The topographic survey is a 4,000 less because we're doing also for the mud, the water line replacements. And so there's some surveying in that that we moved into their contract to help share in that as well. And so you can see the bottom line number the total uh, CIP cost under the estimated cost is $1.22 million versus the CIP budget of $1.323 uh, million. Uh, and so I feel like we're in pretty good shape uh, there on that. I want to um, make a quick note is Tom has refined these numbers since I sent mine out. So yeah. his, his are newer than mine, and so that's why if you see a discrepancy, it's because – uh, he keeps refining this, and, and those costs will continue to be refined as we continue going through this process. Right. Yeah, thanks for doing that, Stephen. I forgot to mention that. And we will before we go out to bed, and I'll talk to you a little bit later here about the schedule 
uh, when we get ready to go out to bid, we'll do what we consider a final uh, estimated cost of, of everything because as we're going through design we're always tweaking this and as things things change through that so let me ask so, can I yes, ask one sir, question you the, bet so the CIP that we have uh, in the budget that is that is including engineering all, all of that right there Different than that total. This is inclusive of the engineering. So it is, okay. Yeah. That's what yeah. I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. When we Sorry. develop the CIP, uh, Stephen asked us to put all the engineering and surveying oh, that's, costs that's and everything good. in there so that this bottom line number uh, would be that, that total project cost. I, I like it lower than what but, we <laughs> and we yeah and uh, naturally we we all do it and, and and you know and for us uh you know you sweat that a little bit because we help develop those cip budget numbers and then when you get into the design you kind of hold your breath a little bit and hopefully right. we did a good job so hopefully with this we've got 100 grand here we'll carry over to the next and if there's something there that hopefully as we get through all of this uh that means that this accumulates and that you guys will have a savings through all of this. That would be our ultimate goal. Anything else, questions about cost or anything? So I'm going to back up just a little bit then. So the, pro the, the streets, and I'm going to let Mike come up here in a minute and uh, just talk to you about the, uh, uh, the streets. And so we have under the CIP, uh, Pebble Beach is in here off of Indian Creek, and then there's Pin Oak, which is off of Trophy Wood, and then you go up a little bit to the north, and then there's Timberline Court. Cypress Court, then, was one that is was not in the original CIP, correct, Stephen? It was and added later. It was added to the end. And so I just broke this out separate because that wasn't something we had in that original part. And this is a, a, a drainage improvement there in Hogan's Glen there in Cypress Court. Mike will show you some information on that. Of uh, There's drainage that's not staying in the street, getting into the system, and it's running down someone's driveway and, and uh, apparently a little bit of flooding issue there. So this was determined to add this uh, to this package, trying to add small things like this to the package so that you get a little bit of economy of scale with a contractor mobilizing and that kind of thing. So that's what we've got here uh, on that. So I'm going to let Mike uh, come up here and want him to just go through some of the, the uh, improvements that we're <coughs> doing, and he can kind of present that to you, and then we can answer any questions that you guys might have on that. Good evening. Um, I'm going to walk you through uh, the different projects we have, show you a couple of project photos, and then show you just an overview of the improvements that we have. So first we'll start on Timberline Court. Um, a few project photos, as you can see, when they went out and identified the streets, they looked at obviously the deterioration of, of the streets. All the streets in front of you um, were built in the mid-70s, um, and they've exceeded basically their design life for concrete pavement. Um, this is actually in the, at the end of Timberline Court, um, and then this is looking back towards Indian Creek Drive. Uh, you can see that um, that the street department has actually already, if you look at that panel here, they've already replaced these panels um, previously, but they're still cracking, which is an indication of poor subgrade, potentially water getting in there, freezing expansion. So this street, definitely time to be replaced. Um, another picture, uh, with all these streets, I will say, these will be total reconstructions, uh, similar to what we're doing on Indian Creek. Uh, we will replace the entire street from right of way to right of way, including all driveways, uh, uh, repairing uh, mailboxes and replacing those, as well as restoration of landscape and yards. Yes, sir. Will this project also include replacing the subgrade to avoid having to go back like you just showed us? and? repeat what was already been done? Yes, sir. All these streets will be per the new town standard, well, the updated town standards uh, that have been definitely updated from the 70s, but it's a thicker pavement section and a thicker subgrade section, and they will either be lime or cement stabilized based on uh, the soil conditions we encounter. So just something real quick so you guys know. You may hear lime 
is being used, or you may hear that semen is being used. And as Mike mentioned, it's about what you encounter. So if you have very, if you have a lot of soil that's heavy in clay, you use a lot of lime. If you have a lot of soil that is heavy with sand, you use cement. And in some cases, you may have to use both. So I know on Indian Creek, we had a small section to where we were using lime. Well, we hit a patch of really sandy soil and we had to switch over to cement. And so that's sort of, um, with some of these streets, um, especially where we are within the Metroplex and being located next to a lake with a lot of creeks and everything, sometimes you do get that sandy soil that's interspersed with a lot of the clay. So that's, if you hear that, or if you wanna know what that is, that's sort of why you use lime and why you use sand. Correct, thanks, Stephen. And, why and you Ed, Ed can attest to that uh, project in the past that uh, Stephen said, you went halfway up with lime and then all of a sudden changed to sandy soils and we had to switch to cement stabilized subgrade. So, yes, sir. I am just curious with technology improvements being what they are, will the service life of these streets be longer with new technology, will they go 40 years, 50 years versus 25 or 30? What's the, the? The typical design life of concrete pavement is generally in that 25 to 30 year range. Um, that's based on, they do it based on uh, equivalent single axle loads or ESALs. And all the empirical data will tell you that a design life of a street is typically, a concrete street is typically 25 to 30 years. Obviously maintenance, comes into that, how well you maintain your streets, seal your joints, stuff like that, but uh, that's the typical design life. Thank you. We sometimes anticipate some of these minor streets like Timberline Court, which is mainly just residential traffic. So it's just your typical homeowner that's coming through there. There's not, you know, you, you don't, it's not an arterial road. So I would expect a street like Timberline or Pin Oak or you name it, to probably last much longer than let's say Indian Creek because it just is not getting the amount of traffic every single day uh, that, that the kind of neighborhood off streets are. That's right, all the construction traffic, everything that goes down a major arterial. So just another picture here. So I'll point out the improvements here. As I said, we're going from backup curb to backup curb uh, and constructing the entire um, cul-de-sac down to Indian Creek. Uh, we will be replacing driveways um, at all locations as well as lead walks uh, and then repairing irrigation system and yards within the right of way that are disturbed. Moving to Pin Oak Court, um, once again, just a couple of project photos that you can see the, the pavements deteriorated um, and to the street department's credit, they come out and seal these cracks on a routine basis to try to uh, get as much life as they can out of these streets. Uh, heading on. Oh. <laughs> can you go back one slide? <laughs> right. Just checking, okay. Man. <laughs> Is that in the right of way? Uh. <laughs> Is that a legal sign? <laughs> So heading towards the end of, of the cul-de-sac, um, uh, we're gonna replace once again the entire thing, get to the layout, well, let me back up one. This is the outfall at the end of Pin Oak Court. Uh, basically it drains um, through a curb opening and then out to T.W. King is what it does. Um, the improvements will consist once again of, of repairing the whole street what I want to point out here is the drainage that Tom uh, spoke about. In the original CIP, we had anticipated replacing the storm drain system from uh, the end of the cul-de-sac all the way up to basically the paving improvements. When we went in and analyzed the existing storm drain system, uh, it was determined that, that there is adequate capacity in that existing system. So the only thing that we did to kind of clean the area up at the end of the cul-de-sac was rebuild um, and put install a curb inlet there versus it going just through the curb and then we're going to rebuild that head wall that's at the outfall there um, so can you expand on what it is that you all found that helped change your mind about well, what, needing to address well, what, storm drains what we did is is when we do the cip we basically just come in and put worst case scenario everything, yeah we think is going to go in there from a paving drainage standpoint if you're going to tear up the street you want to go ahead and have money in there to put the storm drain because 
you don't do it now, you're not going to do it for 30, 40 more years. Uh, when we go out and actually survey it and design it, we then put everything into our hydraulic models and our what's called storm CAD, and we run the analysis and put all the area that's coming in there, and that tells us a more definitive answer of the system is either uh, adequate or it's undersized and we need to. And I'll elaborate that a little bit more on Pebble Beach uh, because we did find that was the situation there. So moving on to Pebble Beach, um, working from the cul-de-sac uh, and then heading towards Indian Creek. Once again, just a few project photos. Uh, as you can see, the pavement is severely deteriorated. And getting to Indian Creek there. So broken this up into two slides. Um, once again, the paving improvements are, are shaded there. Uh, all the way to the cul-de-sac. As far as the drainage improvements go, what we did is we, once again, we analyzed the system when we got all the survey in, and I'm gonna go forward one. Um, what we did, the, the storm drain system, this is uh, Pebble Beach right here. And what we did is we started analyzing the system from uh, the outfall down here, and we analyzed the system all the way up to Pebble Beach. What we found is that the system is adequate from here to Pebble Beach. So does the mouse point on there, on th that doesn't show up on that screen. I'm sorry, no, let me see. Just, like yeah. if you move the mouse around, okay. there you go. Right yeah. there, Can sorry. You do that? Yeah. Thank you. So we evaluated the system from basically, we evaluated this whole run of system. The outfall is here. This is Inverness Drive here and what we found was that the system had capacity, this 36 and this leg of 24 had the capacity to drain all of the areas over here on, on Pebble Beach. However, due to pipe slope, we did find that the system in Pebble Beach was undersized. So I'm gonna back up to the previous slide. The existing system runs behind the curb on the west side and basically runs all the way down to here and then turns and goes towards uh, the Inverness system. So it's in their yard? It's, yeah, it's in, it's in the parkway, the, that 10 feet in, in their front yard. So in order, to, backing up a little bit to what we did on Indian Creek, when we evaluated that and we did that as part of the project that's under construction right now, we analyzed the system to use a parallel system to, not, uh, to get the most benefit for your storm drain. So what we did, is the proposed improvements include leaving this system in place and this inlet, uh, we'll reconstruct this inlet here, but then we're gonna put a parallel system in place here to dry up uh, the street due to the system being oversized. Right now, per uh, the models, in a 100 year rain event, the water is out of the curb and it's ponding on those streets. So once again, this is the time to do it. Um, and we, in lieu of coming in, and ripping up their front yards more than need to be, we just decided to put a parallel system in to do that. Uh, th these will tie in down here and then it'll connect to the existing system there. <coughs> That's the proposed storm drain improvements on Pen Oak, I mean on Pebble Beach, excuse me. Moving to Cypress Court, as Tom mentioned, this was um, a project that was asked to be added in the there's an existing 10-foot inlet on uh, this side of the road as well as one on this side of the road the drainage problem occurs as the the water is coming uh, down the street it's coming to this uh, house and it's topping this and getting down and uh, it's our understanding there's been water in this guy's garage in his house too three times in his house too okay so um the overflow point was to come down the drive and then and then run down the side yard uh, you know due to over time that's built up and some of the capacity of that overflow swell has uh, has been taken up so the proposed improvements that we're showing is to reconstruct these two inlets with larger inlets to, to create more inlet capacity we've analyzed the pipe system here the pipe has plenty of capacity um, the inlets we can add more opening at the surface and allow more water to come in to prevent the water from going over the, 
uh, and into his driveway. So the proposed improvements would be to add uh, larger inlets here, larger storm drain pipe here. In addition, we would add a, uh, a 24 inch pipe here and add an inlet up there to collect some of the water before it gets to his driveway. So on the bottom right of our picture is that <coughs> coming down um, from Cypress? From the gate. gate is. Yes, the, uh, the gate sits it comes back. from Colonial and that, that is area. correct. Yeah. Yeah. W what I observed was that it was almost like the street slanted the wrong way. And on the right side of the street was higher than the left side of the street. And so all the water coming down Colonial basically just went to the left. And the inlet on the right never did anything. This inlet right here? The one up the, the other side. The other side. Oh, yeah, this one. That one right there. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, there, it, the survey we got, it, it shows a very subtle grade change from this point to this point, like three-tenths, you know, the volume of water, it's going to top that right, okay. very quickly. So, And I want to add something because just for counsel is that, yes, this is in Hogan's Glen, and the streets are private, but the storm drainage system is ours. So it is a storm drainage improvement system to that neighborhood. It's not a street reconstruction. It's simply a drainage project. So I know I, there's questions out there that that may have that may be an issue, but the system is our system. It's it's not a street system. So why wouldn't you capture the water up higher, kind of where your uh, indication of north is, capture that colonial water and get it out to the lake from there as opposed to let it continue on down and pool maybe you can't do that but simply boost this path yeah, yeah okay that's fine yeah we that's we fine. we analyzed that um i think you're you're asking about putting the inlets up here um yeah we analyzed that and the bulk of your flow that, while there is some coming off a of colonial there is a large amount of flow coming up from you have that part of Cypress. Yes. Correct. You have a lot of grade right there as you go towards that's south. Correct. Those houses. Yeah. That's correct. Right. Yeah, gotcha. these, these driveways are really, really steep mm -hmm. in here, and everything's coming yeah. to the front of those. Okay. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Tom and let him discuss schedule. Can you go back to the Pebble Beach section for a yes, second? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, well, that's good. Okay. So my concern, Tom, is on the left side of the picture where the new storm 24-inch pipe is under the road and then joins down there. Down here. Mm -hmm. um, what's the size of the pipe going out that I can't see that? That's a 24-inch storm drain. And uh, you might not have picked up on it when Mike was describing that. Uh, the the storm drain that's in Pebble Beach right now is an 18 inch, and it's real shallow and it's real flat. Now, why they did that, I don't know. That's why it's behind the curb, I guess, and not in the street, because uh -huh. normally you put them in the street. But that 24 inch that heads out towards the, uh, uh, the Inverness system, it really falls off and is a lot steeper, and so you get a lot more capacity right, out okay. of it. And so we, what we did is we analyzed it hydraulically and ran all the way up to make sure that the water stays in the system essentially. And so that's why we're not having to go between people's yards, thankfully, and tear that up or replace it and upsize it. So right, we're you. able to do that. So the gray the, or the lack of slope in the existing 18 inch uh, prevents it from f functioning 18 compared to 24. I think yeah. where Nick was leading, <laughs> where Nick was thinking was, well, I've got an 18 and a 24, but the 18's not really functioning at full. Yeah, capacity. That, that's right. And and the things that we do engineering wise, when we run, we run and computer models that have a hydraulic grade line, you design a storm drain system under pressure. And so you want that hydraulic gradient to be below the grade. Well, this is like two or three feet out of the ground, especially with it being shallow. So if the pipes deeper, you can put more pressure on it and, and get more capacity. Um, so just then summing this all up, uh, on here, I didn't. I didn't really put the schedule on. We kind of work with working with Stephen. The, the the idea, like with all of these street jobs, we try to take. We want to maximize our summer, and Ed's 
you know, doesn't have anything else to do and doesn't want to take vacation in the summer, so we want to keep, <laughs> keep Ed busy. So what we try to do is get these out to, to bid as quick as we can. And so right now we're looking to let it for bid on the 20th, uh, of, of which is next month, uh, and open bids on the 12th of May. Uh, we'd be looking to come to council then to uh, uh, make a recommendation to award to a, uh, a, a low bidder on May the 26th council meeting. Uh, and then with that, uh, once we do that, we would uh, plan on having a citizens uh, meeting because there's a lot of residents here that will be inconvenienced because of construction and, and, and especially these residential streets. This is going to be a real challenge uh, for the contractor and for everybody. So we'd have a citizens uh, meeting on June the 8th uh, in the evening to make it as convenient for everybody uh, with the idea of starting construction on June the 15th. Stevens asked us to see what we can do to kind of move that up a little bit, and so we'll see if we can work on that schedule some. The one thing that we do, do on this, as we did on Indian Creek, we have AC pipe in the water line, the old, the old asbestos cement pipe, and so uh, the MUD is uh, put in their budget to replace all of that with new PVC pipe, and so that way you don't have that old AC pipe breaking and tearing up your streets later. So we, we have a, a dual contract here under one contractor, but they're dual contracts. And so we've also got to meet the MUD board uh, meeting schedule as well. So that's generally kind of our schedule. And then looking at this, one of the things that uh, uh, Ed's talked to our current contractor and we're trying to uh, bring a contractor in during this just to get benefit from a contractor's perspective about uh, bit, uh, construction approach, <coughs> sequence of construction, traffic control, and all that kind of stuff, and then time, uh, what it would take. But we, but looking at it, we start construction in uh, June 15. We'll be probably going. We'll go all through this year, uh, and then finish up the first part of next year. So, I'm glad Tom mentions this because couple a couple of different things is one logistically this is going to be a very especially pebble beach is going to be a very difficult reconstruction uh, there's it's it's a when i say long it's relatively speaking but there's no place to break it up from a logistics there's no there's no the width of the street is not wide enough for materials and so we've started talking about how do we phase it how do we do it and it's going to be inconvenient for those homeowners there, but they're going to get a brand new street. And so we've talked about how do we phase it from one to the other to the other. Do we, and, and I think that's where meeting with contractors will help to say, okay, what's the fastest way? What's the best way? And then we kind of look at it from that perspective. The reason I'm wanting to get going sooner rather than later is to try to finish with as much construction as possible by the holidays. Um, by the time we get to December. And so the more hot, dry weather we have, the, the better it is for us uh, to try to finish as soon as possible. Um, one of the ideas I had for the, for the town hall meeting with the residents is to do something very similar that we did for the drainage projects on Fresh Meadow, Timber Ridge, um, is to have because if you have one meeting for all the residents, it kind of turns into kind of a free-for-all. So one of the things we did on those projects was we had stations, and they were kind of manned by one person. So, you know, Tom would be at one, Mike Wilson would be at one, you know, Ed, you know, somebody else would be at these kind of all these three spots. So if you live on Pin Oak, go to the Pin Oak section here in this in this room with the map so you can specifically talk to somebody about that particular project. If you live on Pebble Beach, you go to that section and you talk with that particular person and or group of people about that and hear what they have to say, answer their questions specifically, and then towards the end have kind of a wrap-up session. And, and that's so that you actually can answer one-on-one -on -one a little bit easier about questions, you can address problems, and then we can because at that point, we hopefully will have a contractor 
and we want to be able to have those residents meet the contractor, hear their concerns, um, know the name, the face, the company, those types of things. So that's kind of where I'm starting to lean towards in terms of getting people notified, informed about this is going to come. And, and part of me says maybe we should have one before then. Um, but, you know, I know a lot of these folks are, are really quite interested in having their street done. Um, I, I know that they're, they're excited about getting it done. I don't think they know what construction means sometimes, but um, it's kind of a short sacrifice for a really long time, and it's to the benefit of their home. Tom, anything else? No, sir. Okay. Council, any questions? I'll make a motion. All right. Uh, make a motion to approve street reconstruction of Pebble Beach Drive, Timberline Court, Pin Oak Court, and Cypress Court. Approving the authorization for professional services between the town and Tignall and Perkins, and authorizing the town manager or his designee to execute all necessary documents for professional services. I'll second that. I have a motion by Clear <coughs> Pro Tem Lamont and a second by Councilman Paro. Any discussion? Hearing none, call for the vote. All those in favor, show your hands. All opposed, same sign. No opposed. It is unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys, for coming. All right. Council, I'm going to take us back to our item one and two. And item one, discussion of agenda items posted for consideration on the regular session council agenda for tonight. Got to wait for that. Obviously, we've discussed most of those, but if somebody has a question about something else coming up, we'll deal with it. No one? All right. Item two, discussion of agenda items posted for consideration on the upcoming regular session council agenda for April the 14th. And does anybody have any questions about that? I have a couple, but anybody else? I have a question on um, the baseball contract. Can, can we also get, and I've asked for this way back, but I never got it, but is there any possible way that we can get a breakdown of soccer as well just so as a comparison uh, I, they may not be as accurate as baseball but just sort of where demographically we are and residentially let me see what i can get okay. on that line did we ever receive the financials from baseball? Yeah, from baseball i think we did but let me follow up with adam and if not then we'll ask john again for those okay. <clears throat> all right um there's an item that is um, towards the bottom that says consider and take appropriate action regarding minor site pl plan requirements as discussed at the February 24th, 2015 Town Council meeting. What's the minor site plan are we talking about? So remember our discussion regarding the medical office building okay. and what constitutes needing to come back through plan review, uh, what what uh, what options does staff have to approve certain things and not and so we're working on that right now okay and so the plan is to be able to bring that forward for discussion and feedback from the town council <laughs> which is really all plans that's right for a, site I, plans. I thought it was something specific no, i was trying to figure it, it's out it's the which general one. rules yeah we 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 heard some suggestions and then we asked staff to consider and that's bring right. a re recommendation back to us on how they wanted to amend the process yep. um there is i have one little one there's a um Per the, uh, the Schaffner method on future agenda items, there's one coming up that I had put on a while back about uh, our uh, parking situations over by over on Parkview and Park Lane over by Independence and Beck and all that. Um, if uh, at this point all we really need to hear is where is staff at? Are we ready to have a workshop on it or not? We don't have to. There's no pr necessarily ex expectation to physically workshop it in two weeks. But I think going with Phillip's uh, intention for this is it's a checkpoint to see if 
if y'all have anything or not and if y'all have any you know where we're at there so i think um chief i think we'll be ready by then don't you think yeah we'll be ready Stephen, when we had that conversation um did you ever get the traffic counts over there in front of that yes i sent those to the council Fantastic. I, I'll, I'll reset. And, and I review and, those. And, 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 and what I can do it. is what I'll do for that agenda packet is I will resend that uh, so you guys have that. I'm gonna give him a hard copy. <laughs> yeah. Can you give me a hard copy I of that, will. please? Yeah. You use the email. Uh huh. The yeah. beard, beard got in the way. Yeah. That was the problem with that surface, wasn't it? Yes. Is that when you dropped your surface and it broke? It's gone it's now. Yeah. Gone it's gone. What happened? It was an internet algae. I dropped it. It broke. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you, I can resend it to you if you that's want. Okay. I was just going to say during that discussion, it would probably make sense yeah. to talk about. And that's that. we'll we'll have that. What's we'll, my point? We'll, I'll provide that again to the town council, just as a good refresher. So, uh, towards the bottom of the that agenda is um, deliberation with the town attorney and the town secretary. Um, are these evaluations that are planned there? And so for the town attorney, that's the annual, right? And uh, for the town secretary, that's a X month. Well, you had asked me to uh, go ahead and put that on there. It'd be like my six month review because I think my probation is up in uh, May. No, not May, actually in January, so June. Same time mine's up. Garrett's close. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, really review, it's not. It's not. And, and thank you, uh, uh, Holly, for reminding me. Part of the reason that I said let's do it is the, the council wants to make sure that um, we're communicating adequately with the town secretary. She's doing what we're asking her to do, and so it's a time for us to have a dialogue. Nothing more than a dialogue is really considered there. It's not really an evaluation as much as it is make sure we're on the same page and what she working on, some of the things you're aware she's working on because Stephen has updated that for us. And uh, I think one of your reports, Stephen, indicated an issue we had with a project that we had given her to deal with, uh, laser fish. Mm -hmm. Was that in one of your reports? Yes, sir. Okay. So it, it'll be a chance to talk about that. All right. Anybody else have anything for that agenda that's planned for our next meeting? Yeah, I had a question on when we have, when they when we do budget amendments, what what triggers a, what triggers that? Well, there's a, a couple of different things. One of them, we, we typically try to do, as we. I don't. It, it's a lot of work to do a budget amendment, traditionally depending on what it is, and so, um, we try to do them twice a year, and so we're at mid year. And so we've got some things we need to clean up, such as like the TMRS contribution. We've got some other things that we need to put in there. Uh, so that's really what's triggering this is that we're mid-year. We know that there have been some changes and some things that we need to do. It's a good time to do it. We're also going to have a mid-year report to you coming up about uh, where we stand once we finish through the sixth month. So we'll probably be, I don't know if that's scheduled for the second meeting in April or maybe the first one in May is where we're going to tell you this is six months. This is where we're going to be, where we think we're going to finish the year. Um, and, the, and we'll traditionally do another budget amendment uh, at the end of the year to clean up anything that we may have. Um, if there's anything that we know that's outstanding or has changed, we'll, we'll do that as well. It, it's, uh, there's not something that per se triggers it, but, you know, I, I prefer to do them a couple of times a year, you know, because we know that things happen, you know, here and there and, if we can do it, um, it's a lot cleaner sometimes than here's, doing a whole bunch. Here's my question. Last year, on March 3rd, we did one, and developers' fees were 74% 70, over budget at that point. Um, right now, they're 350% over. So is that items that you clean up, things like that, or, or was that just a – well, well, what we would use those excess revenues for is if we have, you know, an so you excess expenditure. So we, have, we try okay, to balance right. it by, by replace, you know, by, so by covering not, our excess So if not, if you don't have that, then you don't really do a budget amendment on that particular item? Yeah, so I'll give you a good example. 
we have some TMRS savings from the, from the change that we made to um, our plan with TMRS and you wanted to buy crosswalk flashers. Well, there wasn't something, there wasn't $55,000 inside the budget for crosswalk flashers. So what we will do is take the savings from some of that, we'll allocate it over for this line item because you have to be able to show that there is, that the expense, that there's a revenue with that expense. And so, you know, in this case, we probably were buying something with that. Right. So we were reallocating it. I, I can't remember right off the top of my head right now, but that's typically why you do it is, okay. I mean, if, if we exceed the budget, that's great, but generally you're doing it because there's something that's come in that you need to offset. Thing with the pool. Uh, that's, the, that's right, the yeah. pool cost, yeah. Okay. And so that's why. Okay. And that's an in-house policy. It's not, we don't have that in the, no it, state requirements, no, no charter sir. requirements. No, it, well. Well, uh, well our well. auditors will, will write us up yeah. if, we, if we're over uh -huh. budget in a particular department. Even at six month interval? No. No. At the end of the at year. At the end of the year, because what they're going to ask, even even if we're, even if let's say a revenue was over considerably, they ask us about that. What changed? What happened? Um, you know, they're they're really looking for these spikes. You know, I'll give you an example: is that uh, police, for example, um, sometimes certain shifts. You know, we alternate shifts, and some of those officers tend to do more activity than other officers, and so sometimes there's a spike. So every year I get asked, and, and hopefully we won't you know, why, why is this citation revenue this high? Well, maybe there was something that happened this year. So, you know, we were more aggressive on warrant roundup. And so, yes, we had more happen in this particular line item than in years past. They, they look for those kinds of trends. It's not just expenses that may have gone over. It may have been money that you didn't spend for some reason. It, and also goes for revenues. They may say, why do you have 350% more you know, why didn't you budget for this? What's what's happening here? Or are you not capturing it someplace else in the, in the right location? So it's it's sort of that big picture. All right, anything else about item two? All right, hearing nothing, we will then go past all the things we've already approved to item number 12. Consider and take appropriate action regarding the updated strategy map with the uh, Trophy Club Town Council mission responsibilities and priorities, discussion of same. Um, one of the I, notes I made was um, given the, the design that's been done, we asked staff to kind of put it in a more uh, pleasing uh, presentation format. <coughs> and so if you have any comments about that, it's time to offer those suggestions. And then I'm looking for direction if you want to replace the map in the back that's on the wall with Absolutely. something, would you like for that to kind of thing to be done? Absolutely. So we're looking for direction here. Yeah. Just one, one thing, April. Can the arrows go up instead of down? It's just well, this was in April. Oh, so my apologies. She she just, helped a little bit, but this was John and oh, um, so the um, and and and, in, and I got a couple of comments about <coughs> about the arrows and really one. And this isn't a criticism, but it's very wordy. And so it's hard to graphically, when you're trying to graphically show something that has a lot of sentences and things. So how do we capture this so that we can put it also in the budget book? How does it tie in to the CAFR, all those types of things? And so the reason the arrows are kind of pointed down rather than up is that you, you, you think about your mission and your each that builds. Each Sorry. builds and it so bleeds down to the next level. And yeah, so that's that the top sense. of the pyramid. For me. Mm -hmm. But, you me know, too. this is why we wanted it on there is what ideas do you have? Uh, it, John came to me with about four or five, and we ended up kind of hybriding, putting a hybrid together for this. And so we definitely want your feedback. I'll say that um, my primary concern is the content and then the aesthetics have to achieve other other ends that you're more sensitive to so right. I defer to you guys in terms of the aesthetics um, but whatever it looks like at the end I want it in place of sure. that <laughs> mess yeah <laughs> right. Can I, Tim yeah I, I agree with you it's a little wordy um, but the mission is is a bit hard to read in this font yes I'll capitalize okay um, either separate it or change the font or do something but I mean 
I think well, it's, it's my experience is all caps is hard to read. Yeah, it's it's difficult to read. Well, I think they were keeping it the same as responsibilities because responsibilities just doesn't fit. You know what I mean? It's hard to fit that huge word in there. Yeah, so, but it's so just then they kept this. I'm just saying. I'm oh, saying you're talking yes, about the I'm top fund, the top mission. Yeah, the actual mission, yeah, the actual oh, mission statement. I thought you meant mission. No, no. <laughs> I can read. Mission. Get your foot out of your mouth. <laughs> well, that's bigger than mission. All right, can we center the bottom a little better? Just uh, that's really critical, but <laughs> which way? No, just center vertically. You know what I'm saying? Like that center, just center. oh yeah. That's that's really nitpicky. Center within the cell, yeah. vertically and horizontally. Well, well out. Anyway. Just vertically, I think is the issue. Okay, maybe. Can we put Nick's picture? No, <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> well, you're in the magazine. You know, right. the, one, the one thing that we didn't put on here that I wanted your feedback on is we have the Trophy Club Vision 2030. Are you interested in having that someplace on here or not? I would say no. no. Okay. All right. I just wanted to ask that question. and am going to have to get, refresh my memory for me to answer that. What is the 2030 vision statement? There. Well, it's not a statement. It's just – do you want to have it being 2030? Well, There's the five residential or the five pillars oh, of right. premier residential community, uh, no, economic development, working intergovernmental relationships, kind of those big arching, big tier things. I didn't know if you wanted even the mention of the 2030 on here or not. I wouldn't think so. I've always, I don't think so for okay. me. But I mean, yeah, I don't. I don't need it. Okay. I'd I'd like a framed. Poster or a corkboard <laughs> poster or something yep. instead of that. I 100% I, uh, agree. Uh, plexiglass, so somebody doesn't. Well, no, we'll, we'll the uh, the you know. in the principals section, the uh, the sentence that says we pledge to carry out our responsibilities. There's a typo on operating. You might want to just mark that while we're yes. while we're talking about it. I thought we did that. Just just from the visual thing, that. I know it, I send this to Stephen, but the one in the packet was wrong. We okay. caught that. That's the reason there's one at the dais. Got it. I believe on, yes, on, on the visual Gosh. aspect again of these down arrows I know I know the intent is to show one linking down to the next to the next but again when you first look at it I, I was thinking just negative as I saw down arrows and and I'm always uh, try to be upbeat and positive and going in an upward momentum or at least can we put the arrows right and left on either side maybe so that they're expanding and growing and smiley faces. going down just looks negative that's just my opinion. Well, how about how about we do one with arrows going up and arrows going down, and I'll send it out to the council. Great idea. And what about right and left from either side? That's, uh, wait, wait, how are you going to fit it? <laughs> I don't. Turn you just turn one arrow left and move it to the left, and put another arrow to the right and fit it in between. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm okay with them down, but but having one to look at, I'm fine. If it's a, if it's a sticking person. point, something you could do if it's a sticking point is use maybe a different shape um, that would uh, allow you to illustrate the arrow, but then on the bottom one have it make a right angle to go into the principles. I don't know, just down down. If if it really is a right. sticking point, that way it kind of just. Sits. But we'll piddle with it a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean. Who's, and, Who's coming in to help John? No. <laughs> and so it's we'll, we'll kind of piddle with it, and then we'll send something um, out, and then maybe on the 14th agenda, April 14th, we'll put it on consent. If there needs to be something that needs to be done, we can pull it off or something like that. If that works. Right. Great. Um, all right, item 14, town council is on updates, discussion of same park and Recreation Board, March 16th. Uh, council liaison is Councilmember Philip Schaffner and Citizens Financial Advisory Board, March 23rd. Um, and that didn't happen in uh, Mayor Pro Tem Lamont. So, Philip. Um, I was not at the meeting. I was at the EMS uh, subcommittee meeting and the recorder did not work, so I didn't hear it. And Adam didn't send me a uh, synopsis so I don't I have nothing all right <laughs> I, don't, I think it was a very light agenda that I don't even think they had an agenda item other than updates all right and I think I saw emails Bill didn't meet is that right no he did not CFAB didn't meet so no report all right item 
15, Town Manager Sadal's update regarding the following council discussion and input regarding same, Highway 114 and Soundwall, Extravaganza, Discover Trophy Club Magazine. So I had the opportunity to meet with Nancy Klein and her staff. Um, Nancy Klein is our district engineer for TxDOT. She's over Dallas County and we, because we're primarily in Denton County, it reports to the Dallas office. And she presented uh, a preliminary plan for a sound wall, essentially from uh, the edge of PD30 going east towards the Lake City Church of Christ. And then a second wall that would be from the other side of that towards the vineyard apartments. And, um, you know, I was very grateful to get the meeting that they are listening to us regarding a sound wall. The concern I have is where they want to place the sound wall, which is within their right of way, which is really to not, you know, within a few feet back of curb. Um, and if you can think about that area, there's a large berm that almost runs the entire length. There are, there's an encore electrical easement that runs through there. And then there's the homeowner's fence then subsequently behind there. Um, I asked if we could grant them an easement to move it backwards because of the maintenance issue, not just from our perspective, but from encore's perspective. There's also uh, cell, a cellular data location there, and we're going to be looking at another one uh, with Verizon. So I think that it's going to be critical for us to continue to work with TxDOT, com communicate our desires and priorities. Uh, we may need to have some assistance from Commissioner Eads, our county commissioner, with this process. I guess the good news and the bad news is that this project will be done with the Highway 114 lane additions in front of in front of our community to expand it to six lanes. Ultimately, what they say is that 114 will be eight lanes, four and four. But that project is not supposed to be let until August of 2016. So we're about a year and a half, a little less than a year and a half out. So that's the good news is that we have time to kind of address the sound wall. The bad news is, is that traffic congestion in front of our community as you try to head east and west is going to be continue to be a challenge. When you say four and four, mm -hmm. that's going to start in 16? No. Oh, that's three and three that's is 16. three and three is 16. And then ultimately they'll, they'll come back and add another lane on each side, east and west. Okay. So, um, you know, I think the good news, I mean, one of the things I proposed is can we take out the berm and can they use some of that dirt to at least try to level out the area? Uh, I've indicated that if there's no other option, that we would need access to be able to pull a truck, trailer, to be able to get in there to mow. I don't know how Encore would get in there, but that's going to be a challenge. Uh, the other thing is, is that I also indicated that I'm not crazy about the, the corduroy look that we have on the other sound wall uh, that is heading west from Trophy Lake Drive which ironically is all the way back against the homeowner's back property line. So I'm hoping that maybe we can make a good argument for that. But we wanted to, the sound wall panels to be aesthetically pleasing. So um, my proposal to them was that we would sit down with Westlake and kind of think what, what would look good for the corridor as we kind of try to beautify it. This is a good opportunity to, to address that. So this is something that's going to, need to come to the f to the front burner here pretty soon um, we'll reach out to commissioner eads and kind of let him know what's going on and ask wh what options do we have Stephen, since encore is a, a player in this situation because of their easement can we solicit their assistance or support and maybe that, yeah and that's, and that's critical yeah they, they talked about well we imagine. can put removable panels in and i'm like well that's not that's not real feasible for us, you know. <laughs> a project get a crane out, to <laughs> right? You know, a, a project of that scale, done on the highway side of that berm, would be a boondoggle. It would be a straight boondoggle, a waste of taxpayer money. Well, and that's where it's almost. It's, I, I yeah. hate to say it, it's it, it's. That's like the default option. Yeah, yeah. It, there's. It's not. It's not a good plan. Yeah. And, I can say it to him blue in the face. And I think we, as a council, could say it till we're blue in the face. 
but it's probably going to take some assistance to get TxDOT to listen that we would like it. Now, on, on the flip side, I, you know, Nancy was very kind. Her engineers were very supportive and informative, um, and they're willing to come and talk to us, which was nice. They offered to come to meetings and to present, and I appreciate that because that has not always been the case. So. August of 2016. So. Yes. Yes, it was supposed to happen uh, very shortly. In fact, there were some thinking that it would already be under construction, and then it was going to be this spring, summer time frame, and that has been completely pushed unless something happens between now and 2016 where there's funding that's freed up, but I doubt it right now I've already reached out to Andy Eads, right uh, and the mayor of Westlake uh, Stephen will reach out to town manager of Westlake and uh, we'll try to coordinate we had already talked about having a meeting with all the stakeholders about getting funding from the Metropolitan Planning Organization for 114 through Roanoke North Lake which until that's done our bottleneck will always that's continue. right so uh, several projects that we're trying to pull together. Just a question, the Trophy Lake side, is that on TxDOT property? Just that it's narrower over there? I don't think so. I think it's actually on our property. And that's really one of the issues is that the way that it that this area was developed, you know, 40 years ago with the roads and the access roads is that that property behind those property owners' fences is town property. And now there's an encore easement that runs through there. And we used to argue with TxDOT about that they had the obligation to mow it. Mow it, right. Uh, but, they, uh, but they don't. So That's we mow behind the wall. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that is a very, it's a very labor intensive because you can't get a mower back a lot of times on that backside of the berm because it's so steep that you're really going in with, with by hand with a weed eater and you're doing it by hand and, and we've done that in-house but we also try to contract that out and and just because it, it is a big job it's time consuming and if we can get a contractor to do that then we sometimes do that as well it just kind of depends on the schedule and what we've got cooking in town do we have any ability to get back to remove that half broken down sign from the highway side of the wall that that's that's on, belong there that's on my radar um, the that's something that obviously is a sensitive issue because of the discussions that we've had with, with the Beck family. You know, the sign itself is actually a steel, those are steel posts. Mm. And so if you're going to, even in the heaviest wind, those posts aren't going anywhere because they're set, they're peered, and they're steel. Mm. So to actually have them, you have to actually go out there and torch them off yeah. to, in order for that to happen now. Um, At least you took the sign we, off. We've gone through, and, and as from a town staff, that, that part of that sign was blown down. We've gone through and picked that up and removed it. Uh, but there is that remaining piece. And so, yes, that's, that's a code enforcement issue that we're working on. I'll, I'll try to reach out to uh, the regional transportation council member. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> So let's uh, talk about Extravaganza. Oh that God. is this Saturday at 9, or 9 a.m. at Independence East. We've had almost 9,000 eggs almost entirely donated by various organizations, uh, primarily the churches in town. So they've been a great partner. I know the 30th anniversary is doing balloons and, and going to have a presence there, which is great. Uh, it, the event is from babies to 10 years old and there are a couple of different ways they're going to be uh, doing this in terms of you know kind of categories and keeping some kids separate because my son would get run over by a 10 year old who's crazed for some candy um, but I think it's going to be a great great opportunity to you know it, it's really what makes Trophy Club great so um, the Easter Bunny is going to be there there is going to be some music and DJing we have as far as I know, we have put for the Easter Bunny. door hangers along the Royal Troon side to inform them of the event and that there would be noise <laughs> on Saturday morning. So um, as far as I know, that has been done to notify them. So 
um, as an FYI, but Thank you. It, it's a great, it's going to be a great event. I will be there at 7 a.m., and I'm confident that several seven? other. At 7? 7 a.m., yeah. Uh, and I'm confident that several other council members will be joining me. Are you trying to get the candy before the kids get there? 7 a.m. Well, this. my you wife is doing the balloon. Well, I was informed by my wife that I don't, that, that William doesn't get to bring his pretty Easter basket. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the, I guess there's pretty Easter baskets and functional ones, but there's yes, apparently yes. a really nice the one struggle that is real. I'm not allowed to use. Is, yes. is the rumor true? And I guess we're going with plastic or something. I don't know. Is the rumor true that Councilman uh, Paro is the Easter Bunny? I, I can't say that's not <laughs> true. Confirm nor deny. All right, moving on to the next item. <laughs> uh, Discover Trophy Club magazine. That hit mailboxes last week, and... I think everybody should have seen it. I know that April did a really great job pulling that piece together. It, I think it's even better than the last copy that we did. We have about a 16, 18-month shelf life on that, and uh, it's something that we're really proud of. I know that we've gotten feedback from a few residents that have found that the insert with the map for Trophy Club Park was is pretty informative, and they, you know, helps them. If you've never been out there, at least it gives you some frame of reference of where to go. Um, a lot of uh, good information in there that, uh, you know, it's something to be really proud of. So April did a really great job. It's one of the many things she does that helps kind of promote and, and uh, talk about the town and get the word out there. So really appreciate the work she did, and, it, and I think the residents really like it. And it's a good marketing it's a printer piece. Printer issue, right? That's we did have a printer issue. They're, they forgot a heading. On a particular page, so they're giving us 2,400 free copies to make up for that. So well, they're not they're not free. They're, um, they're, he he picked up the existing ones and is re-saddle stitching with a new page, so they'll be corrected. Right, yeah. but we're not paying for it. Right, right. So, other than that, that's it. All right, um, items for future agenda is item number 16. I have one item to add. Um, I've had a request from um, the MUD president, and Stephen has been uh, corresponding with Jennifer, uh, and, and so I want to put that on our future agenda discussion is consideration of the transfer of assets um, to the MUD that typically would have been transferred to them um, when construction was completed and have not been done so and there's some issues trying to attempt to do that so if you'll add that to the future agenda consideration of infrastructure assets being deeded over to the mud so that we don't forget it uh, you got notices today about uh, the mud saying let's have maybe a joint meeting at some point that may be one of the items they're wanting to discuss and it it really is an issue of time to deal with it. It's gonna require some legal research, it's gonna require some effort to deal with that, and everybody's been very busy, uh, so it's not an item that I see moving very rapidly. The infrastructure's not going anywhere, and some of it hasn't been transferred for years, so um, we'll, it's just so we don't lose it as an item. Anybody else have anything to add to future agenda or to remove? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering if we should should we take back the the ordinance, the animal control ordinance, because I, I haven't seen any activity on 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 that, and I uh, well anyway, I just wonder if we should take that back, or do we have an update on that, or do we know where it's at? <coughs> The last update we had was wh it, when we gave it to the board, to the uh, Animal Control Board. Okay. Anybody else have an item to remove or add? All right. Uh, hearing none, we will um, then uh, move on. Um, in just a moment, we will go into executive session, item 17. Pursuant to the section 551.072, deliberations about real property of the Texas Government Code, annotated subchapter 551, Texas Open Meeting Act, 
the council will enter into executive session in order to deliberate the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property where deliberation in an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the position of the governmental body in negotiations with a third person. Potential sites for location of new police and town hall facility, annex building, and potential lease of property. It is 9-10 and we are in executive session. Council, if you want to take five, ten minutes. Council will come to order. It is four minutes before 10 p.m. Um, last item is consideration. Can't even say it. Consideration and take appropriate action regarding executive session. I have a statement to read. Currently, we are in the process of purchasing land along Trophy Wood Drive. The property borders Trophy Wood Drive and goes back to T.W. King Road and adjacent to part of the Holiday Inn. Over the next few months, Council will host town hall meetings to present our plans for the town hall and police building seeking citizen input. The general plan is to be able to call for a bond election in August or the November 2015 ballot which would allow citizen approval of a tax bond to finance the construction of the joint town hall and police facility. We look forward to your involvement in this process as we design and construct a new facility that we all can be proud of and would last for many years. That's the end of the statement. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Greg I'll Lamont second. Moved, seconded by Perro. All in favor, show your hands. All opposed, same sign. We are adjourned.